So why don't you open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 21 and Zechariah chapter 9. Matthew 21 and Zechariah 9. This is part four in our series on Bible prophecy related to the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. And it is surely worth repeating again something that I've said all along in this series, and that is that the goal of this series is to give people irrefutable evidence and confidence that the Bible is what it claims to be, that the Bible is the Word of God, that the Bible is unique in how it proves itself to be the Word of God, that the Bible can be relied upon as the only source of absolute truth, and that we can have absolutely 100% faith in what it teaches. And that such faith is not something that we need to accept blindly, but rather that our faith can be based on what God knows is the single most effective way to establish credibility, and that is through fulfilled prophecy. Not vague prophecies, but detailed prophecies. Not prophecies which prove to be accurate some of the time or even most of the time, but every time, 100% of the time. This is what we see when we examine these prophecies. What we see is God declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Those are God's words from Isaiah 46, verse 10. You could paraphrase those words like this. God is saying, I'm telling you everything I'm going to do long before I do it, and I'm going to do everything I said I'm going to do. And folks, it's a wonderful thing to be able to rest assured in a proclamation like that. Well, when we left off in part three, we were in Matthew chapter 21 where Jesus was entering into Jerusalem on that little donkey, according to the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. So let's go back there to Matthew 21 and continue looking at the marvelous events associated with this last week in the life of Jesus. So Matthew chapter 21, and beginning in verse 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. Now, as we noted last time, this prophecy in verse 5 is from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. So let's go there and take a look at the actual prophecy, Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, which reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Lowly, this is his meek and lowly first coming. Now you might recall that last time I called your attention to the fact that here in verse 9 we have one of the four great behold proclamations in the Old Testament prophets. These behold proclamations are literally prophecies pointing out the nature and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ at his first coming. Notice that this proclamation says Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Now, it is quite appropriate that we find this prophetic reference to Israel's king in Matthew's gospel account. 
because as we have discussed earlier in this series, it is Matthew's gospel account that emphasizes the Messiah as Israel's king. And you might recall that when we examine the two genealogical accounts in Matthew and Luke, that the genealogical account in Matthew also emphasized the role of Israel's Messiah as Israel's king. The focus of Matthew's gospel account is on the king and his kingdom. We also saw that in Luke's account, the genealogy went all the way back to Adam, back to Adam, the first man, because the focus of the gospel of Luke is on the presentation of the Messiah as the perfect man in his humanity. So in Luke's gospel account, we get to see these unique and very often touching personal looks into the human nature of Jesus. And we'll see some of that as we go on with this study. Now, if you were to turn back to Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 12, look at what you find there. It's another behold proclamation. Zechariah 6 verse 12, which reads, And speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. So here it says, Behold the man whose name is a branch. Notice that branch is in all capital letters. At least I think it is in most Bibles. And that's because the Messiah is actually a branch of the Lord. He is the Son of God. Now you might recall that we also referenced Isaiah 42 verse 1 earlier in this, in this study when we were on the subject of the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3. But I did not point out to you at that time that that verse is also another one of these great behold proclamations. So let's go back to Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42 and verse 1, which reads, Behold my servant, my servant. The Messiah, as Israel's servant, is the emphasis in Mark's gospel account. And something else that's very interesting about Mark's gospel account is the complete absence of any genealogy at all. Now, why would that be? Well, that's because nobody is ever really concerned about the genealogy of a servant. When it comes to the servant, all that really matters is whether that servant can get the job done or not. And then finally, we have the Gospel of John. And the outstanding characteristic of the Gospel of John is the presentation of the Messiah as God himself, God incarnate, the Word made flesh. And what kind of a genealogy would you expect to find in relation to God himself? We'll turn over to uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse 1, which reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word, of course, is Jesus Christ. And he was with God from the beginning because he was God. God has no genealogy. He has been in existence from the beginning. And the great behold proclamations for the Messiah as God can be found in Isaiah as well. So go on back to Isaiah in chapter 40. Isaiah 40. In verses 9 and 10, Isaiah 40, verse 9. O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. So verse 9 starts off by saying, O Zion that brings good tidings. 
O Jerusalem, that brings good tidings, behold thy God. Well, these words are clearly reminiscent of those which we see in Matthew 21, associated with the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on that donkey at his first coming. So when you consider the Behold proclamation and the description of the entry into Jerusalem in Matthew 21, you can see how that this Behold proclamation just fits right in with the context there. But notice that you see here in Isaiah 40, the Behold proclamation again in verse 10. But what is different about it there? Let's look at the verse again. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Well, this is a second coming proclamation. Again, you have the differences between the meek and lowly first coming and his coming with power and great glory as we've read in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 and following. So just to summarize all this, we have these four marvelous behold proclamations in the prophetic scriptures which paint a picture of Israel's coming Messiah as Israel's king in Matthew's account, as Israel's servant in Mark's account, as the perfect man in his humanity in Luke's account, and as God himself in John's account. All part of the prophetic scriptures to help Israel recognize their Messiah when he arrives and describing the four different aspects of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go back to Matthew 21. Pick up where we left off there. Matthew 21 and verse 4. Matthew 21, verse 4. We're going to repeat these verses again. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. And so you have this great prophecy from Zechariah 9, verse 9, pertaining to Israel's coming Messiah being fulfilled here. Then we immediately come to the fulfillment of another great prophetic passage as we read on in verse 6. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded and brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and they said him, they said, Jesus, thereon. And a great, very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And of course, this is, this is that day that uh, mo most of Christianity's celebrates as Palm Sunday, the Palm Sunday week. Now, this prophecy also is coming from Psalm 118, which is an extremely, extremely important psalm in the scriptures. So let's go back and look at Psalm 118. We'll be coming back here at least two more times in this study, I believe. And in Psalm 118, we're going to look at, we're going to begin at verse 23 here. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. What is prosperity? That's the kingdom. Send the kingdom. They're asking for the kingdom. Blessed is he, verse 26, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. So verse 26 says, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, just as the multitudes were crying out in Matthew 21, verse 9. But notice what the prophecy says in verse 24. Let's read that verse again. 
It says, this is the day, the day, which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The verse says, this is the day. This was not just another day in the life and history of the nation Israel. This was the day which those true believers in Israel had been waiting for for 483 years. And we'll look into that as we proceed on in, in, in this study. This entry into Jerusalem is an event which is recorded in all four gospel accounts. Now, I pointed out to you uh, more than once how that Luke's gospel account, in that account, you have particular emphasis on the humanity of the Messiah and his human nature. In Luke's gospel account, you find something very interesting pertaining to this event, which is not recorded in the other three gospel accounts. So let's look at something which Jesus did and said, which is recorded in Luke's account in Luke 19. So Luke 19. And we'll begin here in verse 37. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So they are entering into Jerusalem here, just as we read in Matthew 21. Drop down to verse 41, which says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Two things to notice here. As they got near to Jerusalem, Jesus wept over the city. Now, why would he do that? Verse 42 provides the answer. Let's read that again, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. As I said, this was ju just not another day in the life and the history of the nation Israel. This was the day which those true believers in Israel had been waiting for for 483 years, according to Daniel's prophecy. And Jesus is weeping over the fact that in Jerusalem, Jerusalem representing the religious scribes and leaders of the nation, that in Jerusalem, the importance of this specific day is being completely rejected by those scribes and religious leaders. The importance of this specific day is being hid from the eyes of those religious leaders whose only goal at this point is to murder him. And Jesus is weeping over the fact that they are going to reject this prophesied opportunity to accept him as their Messiah. And Jesus is weeping over the fact that the nation is going to fail to do what Scripture calls for them to do in order for that prophesied kingdom to be established here at his first coming. As, verse, um, as the verse in Psalm 118 read, send prosperity now, they're going to miss all of that. These are the things that are breaking the heart of the Messiah. So Jesus is grieved to tears over the fact that his own people are rejecting their special prophesied day and throwing away their opportunity to see their prophesied kingdom become a reality. So here is the human side of Jesus, the natural emotions of the perfect man who cares more about the good of others than himself because he knows at this point that he is going to be rejected, tortured, and murdered. But there is still much, much more to be said about this particular day from the standpoint of fulfilled prophecy, because this is the fulfillment of what might be considered the most profound fulfillment of prophecy in the entire Bible. This is the exact day which was prophesied by Daniel 
in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, as the coming of Messiah the Prince. So let's go back to uh, the book of Daniel and chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 is unquestionably one of the most, if not the most, important prophetic book in all the Bible. Because in Daniel chapter 9, God gives Daniel a timetable which lays out when all prophecy pertaining to Israel's program will be completed and when Israel's prophetic kingdom program will become a reality. And the information begins in Daniel 9, verse 24, which reads, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore, to build, to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And under the end of the war, desolations are determined, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Okay, so the prophecy begins in verse 24 with 70 weeks. Now, to understand the significance of this prophecy, it first needs to be understood that the term weeks in the Bible and in the Jewish culture at that time could refer to various groups of seven. Seven days, seven weeks, seven years, whatever. In this case, it is referring to groups of seven years. So the 70 weeks in verse 24 refers to 70 weeks of seven years, which is 70 times seven years, which is a total of 490 years. Now, as you read through verse 24, it then goes on to outline six important events which will take Israel all the way through the remainder of her prophetic history up to the establishing of Christ and his kingdom. All of that will take a total of 70 weeks, which is 490 years. Now, when you come to verse 25, there are two very important time markers within the 490-year prophecy. The first time marker is where it says, the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. This is the point at which the 490-year countdown begins, when the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem was given. Now, we know what that date was according to historical records. The actual date on which this commandment was given was March 14, 445 B.C. Uh, the account of when this was given can be found in the book of Nehemiah. So we have a starting point at which to begin the 490-year countdown. Now, the second important time marker is in, in verse 25 is unto Messiah the Prince. This refers to the official declaration of Messiah as Israel's Messiah. When did that happen? Well, that's what we've been reading about in Matthew 21. That officially happened on the day in which Christ rode into Jerusalem on that little donkey, presenting himself as Israel's Messiah, according to the prophecy in Zechariah 9, and which we read all about and continue to read about in Matthew 21. That event can be dated as well. It was April 6th, 29 A.D., 
Then notice that verse 25 goes on to say that the time span between these two time markers is going to be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, which is 69 weeks of seven years, which is 483 years. So that is seven years short of the 490 year total time, which is going to be needed to complete Israel's program. Then notice that, uh, well, uh, I want to say that the, uh, that very day, the very day, the exact day on which Israel's prophesied Messiah would be presenting himself as Israel's Messiah was prophesied 483 years 83 years before the actual event did occur. So that is truly one of the most remarkable, fulfilled prophecies in the Bible. And that is why Jesus referred to it as thy day, as we read in Luke's account. We're going to go back to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. and pick up where we left off there. As we continue on in Matthew 21, we, we come to the fulfillment of yet another important prophecy. Verse 10, And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. All right. Now the temple in verse 12 and the house in verse 13 are one and the same. These are both references to the temple in Jerusalem and the temple, of course, is the house of the Lord God of Israel. Now what you have here is the fulfillment of a number of Old Testament prophecies. We're not going to go to each one, but we're going to, we're going to look at um, what was said in four of these Old Testament prophecies. And the first one was from Isaiah 56, verse 7, for your notes. Isaiah 56, verse 7, where it says, Mine house shall be called an house of prayer. So the temple was not intended to be a place of business corruption as it had become under the leadership of the Pharisees. This also fulfills a, a verse in Psalm 69, verse 9, which says, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Jesus could not bear seeing the temple become nothing but a place for these corrupt business dealings of the Pharisees and the other religious leaders. That's Psalm 69, verse 9. Then we have a, Psalm 119, verse 139, which asks the question, is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Well, as Jesus said, that's exactly what the religious leaders turned the temple into. That's uh, Psalm 119, 139. And finally, Jeremiah 7, verse 11. Um, we've already done that one. Um, we, we covered that. Uh, is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? And that's exactly what the re religious leaders had turned the temple into. And so we see Jesus going in and casting out the corruption which the religious leaders of the nation had allowed to take place routinely in the temple, thus fulfilling those, at those four Old Testament prophecies. And I'm sure we could find a number more that it fulfilled as well. But continuing on then in verse 14, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna 
to the son of David, they were sore displeased and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus say unto them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And uh, so here we have in verse 16, uh, we gain a little understanding of yet another prophecy from way back in Psalm 8. We'll take a look at that in Psalm 8. Psalm 8, and uh, we'll do verse 1. O Lord, how Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. And then in verse 2, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Okay. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings. This is exactly what Jesus quoted to them in Matthew 21, 16. The little children who saw Jesus performing all those healings in the temple had more sense and a better understanding of the significance of what they were witnessing than the religious leaders of the nation did. And those children were praising Jesus and crying out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. And here in, in verse 2 in Psalm 8, um, it also says that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. The appropriate praise coming from the children should have put these religious leaders to shame and repentance, but no, they are not about to reconsider what they were doing. And in Psalm 8 too, you probably also have what could be considered a dual fulfillment. Uh, one that will occur in the future as well. Now back to Matthew 21. Following some fruitless interrogations by the religious leaders, Jesus gives them some parables illustrating what is ultimately going to be the fate of those who are rejecting who he is. And Jesus then says to those leaders who are rejecting him in verse... Um, In verse 42, verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Okay, this... Uh, well, the fools that they are, these, these religious leaders are literally fulfilling that critical prophecy from Psalm 118, where we have already been, where we saw that it is quoted, it is marvelous in our eyes. And the other phrase, the head of the corner from Psalm 118, Jesus is bringing that up to them here. And let's go back to that Psalm again, and look at some more things in Psalm 118. Look at these quotes by Jesus here in verse 22. The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So this is exactly what Jesus was pointing out to those leaders in Israel. The stone which they are now rejecting is going to become the cornerstone of everything that the Lord is going to accomplish through Jesus the Messiah. It's not going to happen at his first coming, but it certainly will happen at his second coming. Back to Matthew 21. And then when we come to verse 43, Jesus points out yet another prophecy that is literally being fulfilled because of his, reje his rejection by the religious leaders of the nation. Verse 43 says, therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. 
These religious leaders are under the prideful presumption that they are now and always will be the leaders of Israel and of the kingdom whenever that kingdom arrives. But Jesus informs them that they have no part in the kingdom, they will have no part in the kingdom, and that the kingdom is literally being turned over to the care of those who he is now training to function in his absence. And that's what those seven mystery kingdom parables were all about back in Matthew chapter 13. Let's read this verse again, verse 43. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. A nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. That nation was actually prophesied back in Isaiah chapter 26 and even all the way back to Deuteronomy 32. Let's take a look at it in Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26. And we're going to look at verses uh, 1 and 2. <clears throat> Isaiah 26, verse 1. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. So this is a kingdom passage here. Verse 2 says, Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. This is the righteous nation which will be entering through the gates of the kingdom. These are the followers that Jesus is calling out and who he will be training to function in his absence. And these followers also have another very special and meaningful name in the Bible. Jesus refers to them as the little flock. Let's uh, go over to Luke chapter 12 for a moment. Luke 12. And see what Jesus has to say about this little flock. In chapter 12, verse 32, he says to them, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. To give you the kingdom. All of this is another example of an event which took place back in Israel's history which will turn out to be prophetic of something which is going to take place again in Israel's future. It's kind of like that verse that we looked at in Matthew 2.15, back in part one where the prophet wrote, Out of Egypt have I called my son. We saw how that had a dual fulfillment. Um, God refers to Egypt as his son in Exodus, and he called them out of Egypt. But then again, after the birth of Jesus and Herod's attempt to kill all those children, age two and under, the, uh, Jesus and his family fled to Egypt for a while and he called him back out of Egypt after Herod had died. So this is another verse like that, which we'll see in Deuteronomy 32. So let's go back there, Deuteronomy 32. And see how all this ties in together. Deuteronomy 32 is one of the most remarkable sections of prophecy in the Bible. It was given by Moses shortly before the nation of Israel was ready to enter in and take possession of the land of Canaan, which the Lord had promised to Israel as part of the Abrahamic covenant. Deuteronomy 32 is one of the songs of Moses. Which Moses, where Moses prophesies about the things which are going to happen with Israel, things which are going to prevent the nation from successfully establishing that permanent and never-ending kingdom, which was promised to King David as part of the Davidic covenant. In short, the kings and religious leaders of the nation are going to forsake the laws and commandments of the Lord. That's what they did back then. Just as the religious leaders are going 
going to do during the earthly ministry of Jesus, as we see in Matthew. So we're going to pick this up in Deuteronomy 32 at verse 17. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. So this is what kept Israel from successfully establishing the prophesied kingdom in the days of the Old Testament. They didn't believe God. They turned away from God. Verse 18, of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when God saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And, and he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in, who, in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. So there's God's response to what they had done. And I stop here because everything we have read up to this point in verse 21 is a perfect description of how the religious leaders in, Old in Israel's Old Testament history basically destroyed the nation. And we see the Lord's reaction to their conduct there. But as the verse continues, we have this remarkable phraseology which is so applicable to what Jesus said to the religious leaders of his day in Matthew 21, verse 43, where he said, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So as we finish up this verse 21 here in Deuteronomy 32, it says, I will move them to jealousy with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Now this foolish nation here in Deuteronomy will turn out to be that nation which Jesus was referring to, which will be producing the fruits of righteousness which the Lord is looking for. That foolish nation is also referred to even by the Apostle Paul in Romans 10 verse 19. And it is a reference there, again, to that small group of righteous followers of Jesus, whom Jesus is referred to as the little flock. Let's go back to Matthew 21. Continue on there. So the chapter ends with yet another prophecy, which is ultimately going to be fulfilled at the second coming of Christ. And that's in verse 44, where it says, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So Jesus is again referring to himself as the stone, that cornerstone which the religious leaders are rejecting. And we read, of course, about that stone in Psalm 118. And this is also, by the way, the rock of Matthew 16. Now the prophecy in this verse is about the fate of all those, both individuals and nations, who ultimately reject this stone, those who ultimately reject Jesus the Messiah. And it's a prophecy from back in Daniel chapter 2. Let's take a look at that, Daniel 2. Now, we're going to look at uh, verses 44 and 45. <clears throat> and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone, that is Christ again, was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, 
and the interpretation thereof sure. Now for those of our listeners who are not familiar with this very profound section of prophetic scripture, this is part of Daniel's interpretation of the troubling dream which King Nebuchadnezzar had during the Babylonian captivity of the nation Israel. The stone in verse 45, as I said, is Christ at his second coming, when he comes to establish his never-ending kingdom, which will rule the earth. The iron, the brass, the silver, and the gold all represent the great world powers from the days in which Daniel wrote this up to and including any world powers that might exist at the time of Christ's return to set up that kingdom. And in Matthew 21, verse 44, Christ's warning was to anyone or any nation that attempts to interfere with his kingdom. He will simply grind them to powder. But of course, that will not come to pass until his second coming, and you can count on it. Back to Matthew, Matthew's account again, and moving on into chapter 22, we find something very interesting um, begins to evolve when you get to verse 15. Matthew 22, verse 15, Then the Pharisees went and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. How they might entangle him in his talk. They think they're going to be clever enough to get Jesus to say something that will actually incriminate himself. In Mark's gospel account, Mark states it like this. Those religious leaders are going to interrogate, interrogate Jesus in order to catch him in his words. To catch him in his words. Their initial plan is to try to get Jesus to say something that would incriminate him as an enemy of a state an enemy of the Roman government, then they could simply turn Jesus over to the Roman authorities to be killed. That would be the easiest way to dispose of him. So what do they do? Verse 16. And they send out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. So both the Pharisees and the Herodians are two political parties, so to speak, within the religious leaders of the nation. They usually don't agree with one another on anything, but all the religious leaders and parties readily come together on this one, on this plan to get rid of Jesus. They know they've got to get rid of him. Continuing on in verse 17. Tell us, therefore... What thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he, and they, and, and he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So there's nothing in this response from Jesus that would incriminate him as an enemy of Rome. So it's strike one against the religious leaders. Now we're not going to go through all these questions from the religious leaders, but uh, you might want to make note of the other parallel passages of these interrogations. They are in Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 34, and in Luke chapter 20, verses 19 through 40. And as you read through this and those passages, you, you see another political party by the name of the Sadducees and various chief priests and scribes coming with their questions as well. They're all taking their shots at Jesus. And what they come up with is nothing, absolutely nothing. All the answers from Jesus are perfect and flawless. Not only that, but Jesus follows up their interrogations of him 
with a few questions for them, which they cannot answer without incriminating themselves. And the whole interrogation process ends up with these words in chapter 22, verse uh, 46, which, say, which says, And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Okay, but something that you don't want to miss about this whole process of interrogation is something which is profoundly important prophetically. What you have with all this interrogation is actually the prophetic fulfillment of something extremely important having to do with the Passover feast, specifically the Passover lamb, because Jesus is the literal fulfillment of what that Passover lamb has been representing for over 1,500 years since the first Passover was established before the nation was delivered from Egypt during the Exodus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Jesus is the literal Passover lamb. When that first lamb was chosen, it was chosen on a certain day of the month according to Israel's calendar. Now, do you think you know what day of the month that might have been? Yeah, right, that, that happened to be the very same day that Jesus enter, entered into Jerusalem on that little donkey, declaring himself as Israel's Messiah. And just as Israel was instructed to do back then, in Exodus chapter 12, verses three through six, when that first lamb was chosen over 1,500 years ago, that lamb was not supposed to be killed for the Passover meal right away, but it was supposed to be held for three days and closely inspected to be sure that a perfect lamb without blemish had been chosen. It had to be a perfect lamb. And all these interrogations by these conniving religious leaders of the nation come to prove that Jesus is perfect, flawless, and without blemish, because Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Jesus is the literal Passover lamb. Back to Matthew's gospel again. Uh, when you come to Matthew chapter 23, you have this scathing indictment by Jesus, this indictment against the religious leaders in Israel, those who are seeking to kill him. As Jesus points out all the evil and hypocrisy which they had introduced in the nation. When you come to Matthew ch chapter 24, you come to future prophecy, knowing full well that the kingdom is not going to be a reality at this his first coming. Jesus lays out a chronological outline of the events which will take place in the future when God resumes his program for the nation Israel after the rapture of the present day church of which we are a part. Now for any of our listeners who would like to gain a more comprehensive understanding of those future events, I would suggest they listen to the series titled, So You Miss the Rapture, What Will It Look Like and What Should You Do Now? That series can be heard on our website at gracebiblechurchofrollingmeadows.org, or that series of edited messages can also be obtained in booklet form under the same title. That title again, So You Missed the Rapture, What Will It Look Like, and What Should You Do Now? Now in the latter part of chapter 24, and through most of chapter 25, Jesus teaches a number of parables illustrating what will be taking place among the leaders and citizens within Israel as they await his second coming. Now the thrust of these parables is, what, is that they need to be prepared, to be ready for the trials and tribulations which they will be experiencing preceding his return. So all of that is future prophecy. Now when we get into chapter 26 of Matthew, the account continues with the chronological record of events leading up to the crucifixion. The religious leaders, 
of the nation are still trying to figure out how they're going to do away with Jesus. So we're only, we're only days away from the crucifixion now. So in chapter 26, verses 1 and 2, And it had come to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. So we're only two days from the crucifixion. Verse 3, Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes, and the elders of the people under the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. So they still don't have a plan. They just know they've got to get rid of him. But how? Verse 14. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenant, covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. So in verse 15, Judas Iscariot war, uh, wants to know how much these murderers would pay him to deliver Jesus unto them. And they agree to pay him thirty pieces of silver in fulfillment of another prophecy from Zechariah chapter 11. Let's take a look at that. Zechariah chapter 11. And it's verse 12. Zechariah 11, 12. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver. So here is the prophecy of the price the religious leaders will be paying to have Judas Iscariot betray and deliver Jesus into their hands. Now, as we continue on in Matthew 26, we come to a relatively brief account of the Passover meal which the disciples had prepared for themselves and Jesus. This is what is commonly referred to as the upper room discourse. And for any of our listeners who would like to know all that was said in that discourse. The account to go to is the Gospel of John, where there are five chapters, verses, uh, chapters 13 through 17, that are devoted to what was said in the upper room discourse during the Passover meal. But even in this brief account in Matthew, Jesus tells his disciples three startling things which are going to take place within hours on that very evening. So in chapter 26, look at verses 20, 20 and 21. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Now if you drop down to verse 31, Then Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will, go, I will go before thee into Galilee. But Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night, this very night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Three times he is going to deny him. Jesus knows that this is the night in which Jesus will betray him, and that that is when and 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 that when that happens, all of them, all of the disciples, those who have been faithful all along, they will all flee for their lives. Of course, Peter contends that he would never do such a thing, and Jesus predicts that not only will Peter flee, but that but that before the night is over. Peter will three times deny ever having had any association with Jesus. And Jesus then asks his disciples to wait for him while he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is the location where the betrayal and the apprehension of Jesus will take place. 
and I think that will, I think it will close uh, before we get into the garden and the, and the things that took place there. And we'll pick up with that next week. We'll end with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father,